Mayo Clinic presents the Always On EM podcast, hosted by Alex Finch and Vank Bellamconda. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Always On EM, a podcast about emergency medicine from Mayo Clinic. My name is Venk Belamkanda. I'm really excited to be here with my co-host, Dr. Alex Finch. How are you today? I'm doing great. Looking forward to another fantastic episode of Always On EM. Can you believe it's already October? I can't, but but it's really beautiful. The pumpkin is in all the drinks, which I'm a fan of. The weather has just a little bit of Christmas if you're up here in Minnesota, and uh, the leaves are starting to change. And I know you love watching birds. I bet that this is a great time. Oh, it's phenomenal. Yeah, all, you, several of the migratory bird species are coming through. And get outside, get a pair of binoculars, and go to your local lake. It's a, a day of fun. I guarantee it. You know, October is, in addition to Halloween, and of course the frightful episode that we have coming up, <laughs> um, it is National Book Month. I didn't know that. And so I thought I would share some of my favorite physician authors. And this may sound, I don't know, too mainstream, but honestly, it begins and ends to me with Dr. Michael Crichton. And I've loved every one of his books, Fear, Jurassic Park, Andromeda Strain, Dragon Teeth. Do you have any books of his that you've read? Uh, I've seen the movie for Jurassic Park. I haven't read the, the book, but you know, there's movies in your childhood that really kind of define an era. And Jurassic Park came out when I was a, a kid and it was sort of the initial foray into, uh, robots the, you know, he had those, yeah. those mechanical dinosaurs as well as CGI Yes, and all those movies around the era, the matrix, et cetera, have really defined, uh, what it is to make a movie. And, the reality of watching the T-Rex come down and the glass of water vibrate, just incredible. Never, it, I'll never forget it. Absolutely is. And believe it or not, the book has so much more than that. Really? That There's still stories and events that happened in those books that have not been turned into movies yet. I, that's hard to believe. I have, I have lost track. As much as I enjoy Jurassic Park, I have, I've lost track of where we are in the cinematic universe. Get the audiobooks. They're phenomenal. Okay. Also on my list is Dr. Abraham Varghese, and he wrote a book called My Own Country, which it talks about his journey as an infectious disease doc in West Virginia, rural West Virginia, during the time when HIV, or at least the illness of AIDS, was was making its presence known, but people didn't understand it very well. And he talked about all the stigma and how it felt to um, wear all the protective gear before seeing the patients. And I'm reminded of that as we went through the, our recent pandemic and how there was so much emotion tied to it. Every time I would wear our PPE, I really reflected on his description in the book on what that was like. And then one of the authors is new to my list, and that's Dr. Rick Winters, who has the office right next to mine. But I love his recent book, You're the Leader, Now What? And then lastly, Dr. Robin Cook's Outbreak, which is very different than the movie again. The book itself was phenomenal, and I am in fact rereading it again now. Can you think of any way to celebrate National Book Month? Well, I haven't read Dr. Vergesi's book, but um, I did watch his TED Talk from 2011. And it's it was just one of the best talks. Alex, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I know we're having a great talk about book month, but really this month is about our guest. And our guest has just arrived. She is the wonderful Dr. Katie Young. She's an amazing physician dedicated to cardiovascular obstetrics, which I didn't realize was a subspecialty, but I'm excited that it is. Did you know that? I, I didn't know. Um, and I had reached out to one of our colleagues in the emergency department. We have cardiologists who rotate through. And they talked about this clinic because we wanted to know more about this topic. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to know more about not only the, today's topic, but also the, the clinic that you, you run. And Dr. Young, she got her medical degree at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine and then finished internal medicine residency and cardiovascular medicine fellowship here at Mayo Clinic. 
She's dedicated her career, her teaching, numerous publications to internal medicine, cardiology, with a focus, of course, on women who are pregnant. As a result, she's co-director of the Cardiovascular Obstetrics Clinic. And welcome so much, Dr. Young. For the, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm really excited to talk about the topic today and cardioobstetrics in general um, and hope to impart some uh, knowledge on this topic. So I'm happy to be here. Before we go too in-depth into our topic. Tell us a little bit more about this unique pathway that you forged and about the, the, the clinic you run. Yeah, so in general, I would say in cardiology, the field of cardioobstetrics has really blossomed in the last several years. And part of that is related to the fact that maternal mortality rates are so high in the United States compared to other countries. And when you look at causes of maternal mortality, cardiovascular disease is a leading contributor to that. And so from that, um, you know, we obviously there's a importance to highlight uh, the care of women with cardiac disease in pregnancy. And so certainly that's been being done you know, for, for many years, um, but now is becoming in a more formalized fashion um, and in a multidisciplinary fashion. So realizing that women that are pregnant not only need care from our, you know, expert colleagues in maternal fetal medicine, um, but cardiology can also some, you know, be helpful and additive to that when the women have underlying cardiovascular disease. And within cardiology, it may possibly be uh, that they need to meet with a couple subspecialists, actually, depending on if it's congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease. Is it a rhythm disorder? Is it valvular heart disease? So really, a broad spectrum of, of cardiovascular disease is covered. And um, what's great about developing or kind of formalizing a cardiovascular obstetrics clinic is it's a hub where women can go. So they can reach out, they know where to go, um, they can come and see us, and we can help coordinate that care across multiple disciplines as indicated by their needs. I love that. Is it a physical location across the clinic, or is it a set of like-minded individuals spread out in different departments? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. We do. So we see, um, you know, from a cardiology standpoint, we see them in our outpatient clinic. Um, we try and coordinate the care, particularly with our maternal fetal medicine colleagues, so that the visits are they're not always at the same time. So sometimes we've seen patients concomitantly, but at least the visits are coordinated in such that within a couple of days, a day or two, women are able to get access to all of these subspecialists and kind of formulate a plan all together. And yeah. if you had to break down the types of cardiovascular disease that affect women who are pregnant most, or that come to your yeah. clinic most. Yeah. Help us understand what that looks like. And I would probably, I think it breaks into a couple buckets. So we have women that were born with heart disease or congenital heart disease. So that's certainly a subset of patients, um, you know, with treatments and advancements in care of women with congenital heart disease. They're living longer and um, able to um, kind of get to childbearing age. And so that in involves a lot of counseling um, as well. So that's just kind of a group of patients. And then within what we call acquired heart disease are those diseases that develop, you know, that you were not born with that develop over your lifespan. Probably the most common would be uh, uh, cardiomyopathies, similar um, either born, you know, or kind of developed cardiomyopathies or such as our topic today, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, diseases of the aorta, so aortopathies, or, uh, and that can be a wide spectrum as well. And um, with women having children at uh, older ages, uh, we also see more things like even coronary artery disease. Um, and that can be another kind of subset of patients we help care for through pregnancy. You've said a couple of key words here, and I heard you mention maternal mortality, which already starts to get the hairs on the back of my neck up because talk about nightmares in the emergency department. I think this mm -hmm. is this is probably other than uh, the coding infant. Um, this is yeah. this is the thing that I, I worry about on a clinical shift. I want my care of this to be absolutely perfect. Is it okay if we talk a little bit about a case? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm working in a single coverage emergency department um, in a, a little bit of a rural area, and I have a 32-year-old female who is in the last month of pregnancy. 
and she comes in and she she looks dyspneic. She's working pretty hard to breathe. Uh, I notice she has some lower extremity pitting edema, and I'm starting to think through how I'm going to manage her in my rural emergency department. In my mind, I am at this point really thinking this is something like preeclampsia, that sort of spectrum of disease. And so I'm, I'm starting to work that up. Tell me what I can do to start working through this patient and, and am I necessarily going down the right path? Yeah, so I think, um, so certainly as we kind of know preeclampsia can occur later in pregnancy, can certainly have severe features, including almost uh, uh, what looks like a heart failure presentation as well. And so, yes, certainly something to keep on the differential and treat, you know, obtaining blood pressure, vitals, all those things. Sometimes we don't know, right? So we, so her, her presentation is concerning. So I think keeping kind of a broader differential as well to preeclampsia, heart failure, periperm chromopathy um, would certainly be a trajectory that I would stick with and, and obtain, you know, baseline NT, pro BNP, mm. other laboratory work, looking for signs of uh, your exam is suggesting pulmonary edema, but if we're using POCUS or other things that we can do to look for evidence of uh, pulmonary edema, et cetera, that can help us uh, kind of guide down what path we're, what we're on here. You mentioned considering pulmonary edema mm-hmm. and how is that going to help me differentiate a patient who's in decompensated heart failure from my my preeclamptic patient, they they both are kind of a sick patient population. Mm-hmm. But how am I going to work through that in real time? Because I don't typically think about a pre- NT pro BNP in a preeclampsia patient. How am I making this distinction in in these two? So and and honestly, unless until we get more information, which is probably going to come down the line with either POCUS or echocardiogram to know what their systolic heart function is, what you're determining is do they have signs of you know clinical heart failure. I'm thinking heart failure. And then what is the etiology? And okay. it's important to remember that in preeclampsia, in the setting of hypertension, especially, women can get more diastolic dysfunction and can have a heart failure presentation or pulmonary edema and volume overload in that setting. Though when we get a heart ultrasound and their and their NT prone B could be elevated, but if we get a heart ultrasound, their heart function, the systolic function may be preserved. Hmm. So that's different than like a, a peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is defined by systolic LV dysfunction, where the EF is in fact less than 45%. So there is a distinction there, but when you're first seeing the patient, it, you're, you're, it's hard to know. So the best thing you can do is, is this all consistent with heart failure? And then we start treatment for that. And then we get more data to determine, is this a kind of a severe preeclampsia picture? Or is this indeed a peripartum cardiomyopathy that's manifesting? Dr. Johnson, that's incredibly helpful to distinguish peripartum cardiomyopathy from preeclampsia based on LV dysfunction or preserved LV function. One area I'm still confused about is how do I distinguish peripartum cardiomyopathy from the findings and experiences of late-term pregnancy? Certainly at the extremes, it's very obvious, but when we're talking about less profound symptoms and signs, I would imagine it's very difficult. What advice do you have? Yes, and that is, I think, one of the main challenges in this diagnosis and where this diagnosis can be missed is because there's such an overlap of normal symptoms of late-term pregnancy and heart failure. Women may feel short of breath. They may have edema, but in fact, you know, it's just, uh, you know, the late stage pregnancy. So what I do clinically, obviously, so this patient case aside, if it's more seeing them in the, you know, clinic or the outpatient setting, or they do come to the ER, I would use all the information. So obviously examining them, you know, do, do I hear fluid in the lung, you know, getting more data in that regard. And I do find that, and I've mentioned this, sorry, the NT pro BNP to be very helpful because in normal pregnancy, it can kind of raise, but should always really be normal. So an, an elevated NT pro BNP uh, or cardiac biomarker is not normal in pregnancy. So if that's elevated, uh, it should prompt more evaluation for this patient. So, but if I get that value, it's normal, you know, I'm, I, I'm reassured by their otherwise their examination, you know, lungs sound okay, they're 
it, it can be normal late pregnancy to have a little JVP elevation, but it's not super high. So based on my exam and this kind of basic laboratory ECG data, I can be either reassured or say, mm, we need to do a little bit more looking here. And that's usually going down the route of looking at their heart function. I'd love to pick your brain a little bit about those labs, but before mm -hmm. I do that, what are the questions you're asking a woman to understand their physical activity tolerance and their shortness of breath better? Yep. I, that's a really good question. So I, because as we said, it, it's normal to feel a little bit more short of breath in, in late term pregnancy, but I'm asking them, you know, so what kind of activities are you doing? How much are you able to do? But are you feeling limited? Are you you know, in your day-to-day -day activities or things that you normally did three weeks ago or a month ago, are you finding that you have to really stop short, stop your activities, alter your activities? Are you avoiding things that you used to do because you get so short of breath? That's kind of how I try to phrase that, to tease that out. If And if they say, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm still, you know, walking the dog and I can do it. I just feel a little bit more winded versus they say, I can't climb stairs anymore. Or I, I've been taking the elevator and I used to take the stairs or all of these things um, kind of set your alarm bells off in different ways. And then I also ask about sleeping at night. So looking more for that kind of orthopnea PND flavor. And obviously, again, because of pregnancy, there's other discomforts in late late term pregnancy. But again, if they're saying I sleep in the recliner, you know, th there's certain things you can hear that make you more concerned. Following up on the blood test that you mentioned, to me, our upper limit of BNP seems pretty low here. You know, I think it's 500, right? Mm -hmm. And I often see patients with values that are, you know, 600, 700. Yeah. This is the emergency department approach. It's, yeah. it's like somebody says, uh, we have a, a rotating intern who says they they have hypertension. It's, you know. It's 145. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a, in a non-pregnant patient. And we're like, uh, you can let that go. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, in context, <laughs> it's important, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So to me, I'm imagining... Should I be reacting to a pregnant woman, late pregnancy, with shortness of breath, whose BNP is 600? Is that abnormal? I would. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that That's I so would helpful. consider that abnormal. Okay. Absolutely would consider that abnormal. Again, it may end up being that it's not periperm cardiomyopathy, but maybe it is that preeclampsia severe presentation uh, with some diastolic dysfunction and, and volume overload. It's but it it, is, it would make me want to look further yeah. and not, I would not want to dismiss that. Yeah, I would think that would be an, um, that value would prompt me to say, you know, we should get an echo. We need to look and uh, really make sure things are otherwise okay here. If you're like me, you could use a review of the biochemistry involved in the creation of NT pro BNP. First, the BNP stands for brain natriuretic peptide. Pro-BNP is secreted from the ventricles of the heart in response to stretch, and this molecule is then cleaved by the enzyme furin, which is an endoprotease. This cleavage creates two new molecules. One is BNP, and the other is NT-pro-BNP. NT stands for N-terminal or amino-terminal pro-BNP, and it is the inactive compound and is more biologically stable such that the level doesn't change as frequently as BNP. The NT pro-BNP level is felt to be reflective of about 12 to 24 hours of ventricular stretch within the myocardium. There are, of course, other factors involved in this value you'll see, which includes the clearance issues and Dr. Bagish and others did a review on the on the topic of non-heart failure related causes of elevation of NT pro BNP. The reference will be listed in the show notes. You should consider hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, apical ballooning, inflammatory cardio cardiomyopathies such as myocarditis and chemotherapy, arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, anemia even stroke and critical illness such as bacterial infections, burns, and ARDS have been hypothesized or theorized to be causing elevated BNP. The exact pathophysiology of each of these differentials, as it is best understood, is currently listed in the article. I would caution that many are simply hypothesis stage, whereas some others are more thoroughly flushed out. All of this is outside of pregnancy, and so the understanding of BNP elevation in pregnancy is a little less clear. Oxford University in the UK, led by Dr. Dockery, 
and a bigger research group, has a paper outlining their efforts to establish reference ranges for BNP and NT pro BNP in pregnancy. They studied longitudinally 260 healthy pregnant women as their pregnancy unfolded, doing multiple serum sample checks along the way, and they published their values in, I'm sorry, they published their value ranges in their article, which I will reference in the show notes. I don't know if their values are ready for rigid incorporation into clinical practice. As you can hear from Dr. Young, then there are a lot of considerations for using BNP. However, I think her point is extremely important, and that is elevations in BNP, even if they're small, really should be something not to be overlooked and warrants more attention and consideration. All right. And then you mentioned biomarkers. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm, I might be an outlier in the, in the emergency <laughs> medicine country about this in that I'm very hesitant to use our ultra high sensitivity troponins yeah. because of their false positive rates. Mm-hmm. Is that the wrong practice in this case? Or if the ECG looks okay and the history is not overtly concerning for MI, how do I approach getting the Yeah, so I think so I think we know more about NT pro BNP in pregnancy. There's less data for troponin. And really, I would say for the troponin, like you said, it's more if the clinical picture is not concerning for an MI presentation or a ischemic heart disease presentation, I don't routinely get those. Again, if we diagnose someone with periperium cryomyopathy, sometimes we get a baseline value just as a risk stratification type picture. But again, it's not per se changing our clinical management. But generally speaking, yeah, I think for a pregnant woman, the troponins are most useful if there's this uh, concern for an ischemic or MI presentation. Otherwise, I think it's harder to know. Harder to know. This is Venk jumping in again. The literature is quite sparse on this topic. I did find one study in 2019 with a senior author that's well known to us, a true world expert on the topic of troponin, Dr. Alan Jaffe. He is one of many other researchers, particularly in Malaysia, that performed this study. The study was supported by a troponin testing company that provided the testing samples to the group, and a couple of the authors received speaker fees and consultative relationships with the diagnostic testing companies themselves related to troponin. With this caveat presented, it is one of the few studies of any meaning related to troponin and pregnancy. In this study, the patients were in Malaysia between 18 and 35 years of age, gravita 1 to 5. They were excluded if they had any comorbid conditions or history that could be a confounder to the value such as diabetes, known coronary artery disease, anemia, congenital cardiac diseases, even arrhythmia, and more. These values were taken at a single point in their pregnancy and then stratified by the term that they were currently in when the value was drawn to see if there were any important patterns that we could take away. In essence, they saw that gestational hypertension and preeclampsia were associated with significantly higher values, but not often exceeding that 99th percentile of the troponin range. There were about 2% of patients who were asymptomatic of MI who had values exceeding the 99th percentile. There's no report about the trend of these troponins or potential etiologies, but it does suggest that there might be a false positive rate of troponins that is in that 2% range, or that 2% of the population may have an alternative cause for their troponin elevation, such as SCAD or myocarditis. It's really unclear. There's also a letter to the editor in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology by Dr. Anum Minhas from Johns Hopkins and an entire research group. They measured troponin levels on stored blood samples as part of other NIH-funded work. This was from a previous study going on from 1999 to 2004, and their population were women between the ages of 18 and 40, a portion of whom were pregnant. They used four different troponin assays, and they compared the results of the troponins for women who were pregnant in each of the three trimesters against women who were not pregnant. Their figures in the article show visually how troponin values in in the pregnant cohort are lower than the non-pregnant cohort, both in general when looking at the median, as well as the top end range values as well. They suggest that the reference ranges could be kept essentially the same between pregnancy and non-pregnancy. They also did not feel that their their study had evidence that weight-related changes or hemodynamic changes associated with normal pregnancy were likely to affect the values. Again, I will say they did not find evidence to support that normal changes of pregnancy 
would affect the values of BNP. Okay, back to the discussion. When you get that baseline value, Mm -hmm. how are you documenting that such that there isn't this feeling of urgency to follow up with repeat values and catheterization and all this stuff if it's abnormal? How do you how do you do that? Because I think am I right, Alex, in our group, if that first value is abnormal, they're not getting they're not leaving without more and probably that second value. Yes. I would would be very hesitant to discharge a patient with an abnormal troponin. Uh, who is symptomatic because in my mind, the reason I got the test was I'm worried about the differential, which would include a myocarditis uh, or cardiac strain of some sort, which yep. to me would include the spectrum of... Or even in talking about a pregnancy population, SCAD is mm-hmm. another Absolutely. major uh, thing to think about in this type of presentation mm-hmm. as well. So again, I think it goes back to how your patient is presenting. Uh, if it's predominantly more heart failure presentation, you, it may not be something you get. But if there is that... Uh, if that is a concern and it's in your differential, getting the troponin and then likely, like you said, probably getting that second troponin if there if it's elevated um, again, because we that is something we have to think about. But again, I think this is really just guided by your assessment of the patient yeah. and what your differential is. It, it's harder. Uh, it's hard to tell you, say exactly yeah. what that looks like because yeah. every patient is so different in that regard. Completely but I agree. blanket, you know, kind of my general approach would be. Uh, I find NT pro BNP very helpful in pregnancy, particularly when there's a concern for heart failure symptoms. Troponin, less data on it, but certainly would not shy away from it if it, the concern is, if that's in your differential, if a MI presentation, including SCADs in your differential, we should still be getting those values. Let's take a deeper dive into SCAD and pregnancy. A 2017 study in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology by Drs. Tweet, Sharon Hayes, and Carl Rose, Mayo Clinic's Cardiovascular Medicine Group and Maternal Maternal Fetal Medicine Division, collaborated with other researchers. They reviewed a Mayo Clinic registry of patients that had the diagnosis of SCAD. The registry was created in 2010 with a small retrospective inclusion group and has prospectively been populated since that time. The registry in total has 323 women and cases reported within it, of which 54 had pregnancy-associated SCAD. Most were identified postpartum, but four of the 54 were still pregnant at the time of the diagnosis. 93% had chest pain as their presenting symptom, and nearly 60% had a STEMI on their initial ECGs. 43% had NSTEMIs. The distribution of STEMI to NSTEMI is essentially flipped from the women being diagnosed with SCAD not in pregnancy. This could be reflective of a diagnostic bias related to investigating SCAD in pregnant women. Also in the study, the left main coronary and left anterior descending coronaries were more frequently the vessels involved compared to the non-pregnancy cohort, and multivessel dissections were more frequently seen amongst pregnant women as well. Both of these findings were statistically significant differences compared to the non-pregnant patients with SCAD. Similarly, and more recently, Drs. Chen, Merchant, Marr, and Moore from Kaiser Permanente compared 285 cases of non-pregnancy-associated SCAD and 22 women with SCAD in pregnancy, and they found that there were a significant higher proportion of proximal vessel dissections and more severe presentations similar to Drs. Tweet and Hayes, as mentioned before. The STEMI ratio was the same in this study between pregnancy and non-pregnancy cohorts. To me, this is another condition to be watchful for when thinking about pregnancy-related heart problems. This one is identified more frequently in the first week postpartum and with more serious presentations compared to women who are not pregnant. This could be related to our lack of making the diagnosis when the symptoms are more mild or while women are pregnant, potentially. That part is unclear, as these are registry studies and not prospective investigations. Okay. Can I fast forward the case a little bit? So yeah. at this point, we've gotten some vitals, and uh, I've started my workup. So the patient's blood pressure is 120 over 80, um, 
She's a, a little bit tachycardic, and I did my PE workup. And as a side note today, we're not going to go into the workup for, for PE and pregnancy. At this point, the patient does not have a PE. When I got my chest x-ray because of how dyspneic uh, she was, and maybe I did a, a point-of-care ultrasound, and I saw some B lines, and mm-hmm. I see evidence of uh, what looks like a heart failure presentation in my patient. So now I'm trying to put together what is going on in my head because I had this short of breath patient and I've excluded COVID, influenza, pneumonia uh, as part of my workup. And there's no protein in her urine, which is is not part of the definition anymore of preeclampsia, but still all of a sudden I'm getting away from things that I feel to be more common. Her blood pressure is normal. And I'm now trying to say, wow, this looks more like a heart failure case. She doesn't Mm -hmm. have a history of that. So um, when I'm really leaving the domain of preeclampsia, is it fair to say that uh, in general, that would be diastolic dysfunction? And here I have systolic dysfunction. So if I'm really trying to acutely assess the patient and I see a lot of evidence of pulmonary edema, is that really swaying me more towards a new heart failure diagnosis? Or what else would you use in the moment to try and Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. And so that's important for kind of any heart patient we're seeing or evaluating, or even if they have a history of a cardiomyopathy, heart failure is that clinical volume overload, uh, you know, pulmonary edema, uh, edema, elevated JVP, all those things that we know. So based on what you're telling me, she has features consistent with heart failure. You've ruled out other uh, contributors, infectious and things. And so, and in this setting, in someone who's late term pregnancy, I think we have to suspect that this is, could be a peripartum cardiomyopathy, or is she someone that had something pre-existing that we just didn't know, but with the hemodynamic changes of pregnancy, she's now manifesting, which is also possible. But in that setting, you're not going to know that, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to be able to determine that in that snapshot. I think what's important in that setting is we say, this is not normal. This looks like heart failure. This needs more evaluation. And this patient in particular certainly sounds like someone that should probably go into the hospital, get a heart ultrasound, be started on medical therapy, uh, be decongested and, and let this work up continue. So we're kind of, uh, I'm calling to admit the patient, and I'm considering the diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy. How do I define that, and how do I define my concern for that? If I would say, so at this point, we don't have a formal echo, right? So I would use it, you say, I. Uh, it's really your clinical, your clinical exam and yep. your clinical picture and the patient scenario. Um, and, you know, we say we have uh, this young patient, she's late term pregnancy, now with new heart failure, needs admission for further management and treatment. I think that's really enough there. I can convince I can convince the uh, admitting team. Oh, yeah, for sure. I love it. <laughs> well, it depends on the resident. And the <laughs> year, of course, but, but, yeah, um, I've I got interested in this topic and started to see a lot of definitions. And I want to run a couple by you and see what you think. So um, when I first started scanning about the topic and up to date, it said last month of pregnancy up to five months following delivery, EF less than 45%. And then in another source, it said, but could be above an EF of 45%. And I was like, suddenly our definition's gotten a little bit more hazy. And then I was reading the Jack State of the Art Review in 2020 by Davis and colleagues uh, that broadened the definition to a diagnosis of exclusion in women presenting with heart failure due to LV systolic dysfunction and should be considered when no other cause is evident. And, um, and that was based on the 2010 Heart Failure Association, uh, or 2010 guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology Working Group uh, on heart failure. And so I see variable EFs. I see uh, a variable time in pregnancy. Yep. How can I narrow this down for my dyspneic patient? Yep. So I think of, so peripartum cardiomyopathy is a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay. But again, we don't know all these things when we're evaluating the patient emergently but it's in your differential appropriately. 
So, but if we come down to who am I going to label with a periperm cardiomyopathy because it does have implications for this person moving forward or if it's someone that's thinking about subsequent pregnancy. So it does matter uh, the label that we use. Um, the definition I do use is you know, clinical heart failure with systolic dysfunction, LVEF less than 45%. Okay. That would be the definition. And most commonly... Uh, this presents in the first month postpartum, but can be seen when the mom is still pregnant okay. or up to a few months postpartum. Very interesting. But when you look at studies uh, that have looked at the time course, most women present in that first month postpartum. Interesting. So that's kind of most commonly what you'll see. Um, but then on, from a cardiology side, when I'm seeing these women, maybe it's even after, maybe I might be meeting them after this acute presentation. Um, I look at the timeline. I look at how they presented. Um, I look at what their initial echo showed. And then we also, like I said, they'll need to be mindful that uh, this could be could have been a pre-existing cardiomyopathy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other things that are on the differential um, so certainly genetic cardiomyopathies, non-compaction, uh, uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, um, all of these things need to be considered. And so when I'm meeting a mom, and again, I might meet her during the acute presentation or afterwards, um, we do need to still kind of work through a general cardiomyopathy evaluation to make sure we're not missing something else that's treatable. You mentioned a word non-compaction. Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with that. Can you so, uh, so meaning the left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy. It's a type of cardiomyopathy or heart failure, um, which is again something it's it's you'd have already. The mom would have had that before the pregnancy, but it's in your differential of a of a dilated heart. But again, it requires more evaluation after the fact. And there's certain echo features or other imaging features that would likely point us down that way. I find the timeline so interesting because it's it's not something I think about a lot with heart failure. Normally, I have kind of a patient with an ischemic cardiomyopathy. This has developed over a long time. But as I was studying the hemodynamic changes in pregnancy, really it's the second trimester where we're seeing a lot of changes in our hemodynamics. And so the presentation of a, a, a patient with new decompensated heart failure in the second trimester of pregnancy might tell me something a little bit different than the first month peripartum uh, is that or uh, after delivery is that right yeah so that it is it is important to kind of I'll just kind of reflect on those hemodynamic changes of pregnancy and that is true that so what we see is you know there's a, obviously to support baby there's a increase in plasma volume stroke volume cardiac output and that really peaks in that kind of late second third early 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 third trimester that 28 weeks ish or so so that is um, kind of the time point where you'd expect to see a kind of maximum hemodynamic effect on mom's system but remember that after delivery there's another kind of hemodynamic effect after baby is born as well. So after baby is born, there's a lot of blood volume that again returns to mom's circulation as the uterus contracts down and blood volume is returned. Um, She may have had some blood loss through the the delivery as well. So there's additional changes that happen after delivery as well. And, And actually that first kind of 24 to 48 hours after delivery can be a time where just with that additional volume load, depending on the cardiac disease that uh, they have, could be not well tolerated Mm -hmm. or tolerated okay. Um, And so, and these hemodynamic changes of pregnancy can take several weeks to return to baseline, even out towards more like eight to 12 weeks postpartum. And so you're right though, is that we tend to see women most commonly present that first month postpartum, yet these changes are actually really maximized many weeks before that. Mm. So why there's that delay and kind of, and, and just in general, the pathophysiology of periperm cardiomyopathy in particular is just not fully understood yet. Likely many of these things play into it, um, but it is interesting. There is kind of that a little bit of a, uh, you'd say, well, you'd expect most of them to present then, but in fact, they don't. So it's certainly things that we don't fully understand yet. 
I heard there might be some interplay with prolactin as a theory and then some immunologic theories. Can you ex- yeah. explain some of those? Yeah. So there there have been multiple mechanisms thought to, to play out. So hormonal, hemodynamic, autoimmune, more recently even some like maybe some inflammatory uh, suggestion as well. Certainly some vascular abnormalities may contribute because, you know, we see a high um, coexistence of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and peripartum cardiomyopathy. Mm-hmm. So there can be an overlap in about 40, you know, 40% of women, um, not saying every woman with preeclampsia gets peripartum cardiomyopathy, but when you are seeing your peripartum cardiomyopathy population, many of them have coexistent hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So there, you know, and there's a, a, a vascular uh, flavor there for that also. Now the prolactin has um, effect has been studied in mice models, and there have been uh, a few studies, smaller studies, looking at use of bromocryptine in particular for for hum- adult women, humans in uh, the treatment of peripartum cardiomyopathy. If we suppress that prolactin, do they recover faster? Is there effect on the myocardium to recover faster? And some of those have been somewhat mixed, but that theory has is there. And actually, um, currently in the U.S., or it's actually a multi-center site called Rebirth Trial. Um, it, there is an ongoing trial enroll, actively enrolling women currently uh, with periprime cardiomyopathy, and it's, it's going to be a larger study evaluating the role of bromocryptine in a randomized uh, controlled trial. So I think more to come on that. Uh, use of bromocryptine is not, uh, I'd say in the U.S. is not a, a, a mainstay of treatment. We may consider it more in a very, very severe presentation, um, but is not used super commonly. But I think more to come as this is studied currently. How common is this disorder and what are the types of risk factors I'm going to inquire about yeah. in my history? It's actually, it, the prevalence does depend on the location. So here in the U.S., there's around 1,300 new cases a year, so not super common. Um, but if you, so that's like a range of maybe, it depends honestly on where you look at the data, but maybe one in 1,000, even up to one in 4,000 women. But if you go to other countries, the incidence is much higher. Um, uh, it can be as high in some of the African countries as like one in, I want to say one in 100 to one in 300 women, so much more common. Mm. And that is because also you're talking about risk factors. So we know that this is more common in African-American women, two to three more times more common. And other risk factors include older maternal age, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, as we just briefly talked about, uh, multi-parity, and then multi-gestational pregnancies. So those are the main thing. Or if you by chance know they've had periparm cardiomyopathy before, they're at risk for developing that again. And that's kind of another discussion. But if you hear that in their history, that should certainly raise it on your differential as well. I want to take a moment to recognize that women of color in the United States and in other developing countries are vulnerable to receiving biased health care in the emergency department and in other locations. And this is a good reminder when we think about the fact that women of color are more likely to have peripartum cardiomyopathy, and this has the potential to adversely affect their pregnancy and birth outcomes. If we are aware of the potential biases that adversely affect this population, we might have a potential to improve the health of this very vulnerable population. And the amazing thing is this is not necessarily a very complicated condition as we all in the emergency department manage heart failure syndromes and edema syndromes very frequently. We just need to be aware that it can happen to young, otherwise healthy women, even in the context of pregnancy, the symptoms that they're coming to see us with may be related to something other than their pregnancy or something additional to their pregnancy like a cardiomyopathy and just being aware having discussions and educating ourselves and people who are vulnerable such as women of color uh, who are at risk for this condition can be supremely helpful is it okay if i summarize where we are so far yeah um and so overall a 
potential presentation for this patient would be with something like dyspnea. And I'm having a patient either at the end of her pregnancy uh, or uh, just after delivery presenting with something like dyspnea, and I'm going to see clinical signs of volume overload. And I'm trying to separate that from edema associated with pregnancy, additionally, um, hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, um, and things like PE or myocardial mm-hmm. infarction. So I'm kind of doing all of all of those workups. Uh, but at the end, if I don't have an answer for PE or an other explanation, I'm left with signs of systolic dysfunction, which might include uh, pulmonary edema. And I want to go through some of these tests in a little bit more detail, specifically what I'm going to do and what I'm going to see. And Venk is actually ultrasound trained, and so we'll kind of go through a couple of those findings. But overall, I'm left with predominantly signs of a clinical diagnosis of heart failure and, in this disorder, systolic dysfunction. So the tests that I can do rapidly in the emergency department, I can get a chest X-ray. And I'll see signs of volume overload, which I'm familiar with. Let's talk a little bit more about point-of-care ultrasound. Uh, Venk, what hallmark signs am I going to look for in my rapid exam? I really like using the BLUE protocol, which was published first by Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein, I believe in 2008. The protocol is an excellent way to look for pneumonia, consolidations, and interstitial syndromes like pulmonary edema. The original papers from Europe use the 3 to 5 megahertz curvilinear transducer when they're doing their studies. There are other groups of professionals who use the phased array transducer, like critical care. And then emergency medicine, especially in the United States, tends to gravitate towards using the linear transducer. My personal opinion, from my experience, is that the linear transducer can be very difficult sometimes to evaluate the images when we're talking about lung pathology. And this seems to be borne out as well in a different study, which I'll include in the show notes, where comparisons were made between linear transducer and curvilinear transducer on a handheld ultrasound device on the same patients. And a large portion of the linear studies had to be thrown out because the images were not easy to interpret. Now, when you're looking at any particular portion of the lung, you want to be able to identify the pleural line, and from there you are looking for something called a B line. A B line has seven key features. These are that it is a comet tail type artifact originating from um, an air fluid interface issue within the lung, and it should begin at the pleural line and extend indefinitely. It is hyperechoic or bright, it's well-defined, and it erases any A-lines that might be there. A-lines travel horizontally and in parallel with the body axis, whereas B-lines travel vertically on the ultrasound screen and really go from pleural line deep. They move with the lung. So again, the seven features are that it is a comet tail type artifact, it arises from the pleural line, it is hyperechoic, it is well-defined, it spreads indefinitely, They erase the A-lines that might be present, and they move with the lung. When you see three or more B-lines in a single view, it's considered pathologic. And the original study by Dr. Lichtenstein proposed eight zones, and that is four zones on each side of the chest. Imagine the anterior axillary line of the patient and a horizontal line going through the nipple. That creates a plus sign on on each side of the chest, and that defines four zones that you need to examine around that plus. And if you do that on both sides, that's a total of eight zones. If you have pathology um, related to B-lines in multiple across both sides of the chest, that's very suggestive of pulmonary edema. Whereas if the B-line pathology is really concentrated in just one zone or a location such as the right lower lung, then it's more consistent with pneumonia. It's a lot of fields. That's uh... it's, it's pretty quick, okay. believe it or not. You're on, it's only about a second or two that you spend on each field. So in 30 seconds to a minute, if you get practiced at this, you can do a full blue exam um, really well, really easily. And that's the abdominal abdominal probe. Curvilinear probe, okay. yes. In that's general. incredibly interesting. So I'm looking for three lines per field. I'd be curious, do you know of any quantification in pregnant patients? Yeah, that- I was actually just thinking, I don't know. I am not aware of any studies in, that focused on yeah, I'm not either. Uh you know using a uh, lung ultrasound in pregnancy though I I would think it would be incredibly useful and very applicable. We should partner 
Yes. And do this. I think there that it would is, be Linux. great. Awesome. Yes. So I think it would be, um, I, I would, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine why it wouldn't hold true in this patient popu, you know, same po- patient population. Uh, no radiation, yeah. using ultrasound. I'm wondering if patients who don't have cardiomyopathy mm-hmm. might meet the criteria for pulmonary edema just in late pregnancy. And that so I'd be, be really curious to repeat Daniel Lichtenstein's original blue protocol in the OB clinic with yeah. patients who are having what seems like normal pregnancies. Right. And just see if we should be increasing the number of B-lines for your clinic in right. the obstetric, obstetric right. cardiovascular clinic versus yeah. the standard OB Yeah, almost patient. more just as establishing first what's normal what's in a basic? pregnant, you know, exactly. someone that has a normal pregnancy. Right. Yeah. After the interview, I searched PubMed and found very little. There were two papers on lung ultrasound in COVID in pregnancy and an additional paper, which was a case series of two patients who had lung POCUS performed in pregnancy prior to COVID. In that case series, one case was a woman who was dyspneic and had the blue protocol performed just as I just described using the curvilinear transducer um, or the abdominal transducer and examining four zones of the chest on each side. She had diffuse pulmonary edema and was treated as such and got better. The second case was a woman with preeclampsia who did not have any breathing symptoms and she had lung ultrasound performed, which did not reveal any B lines. I think in general, this is an interesting space that we might have to look into further. Let's get back to the interview. At this point in the interview, Alex also asked about IVC ultrasound. And so I want to comment a little bit about that. IVC ultrasound is an area that has been studied quite extensively in a lot of populations from mechanically ventilated patients to different positioning, supine versus upright, different transducers, different body habituses. And there seems to be a lot of variability in whether it's supremely useful, moderately useful, not useful at all, consistent, not consistent between operators. And in general, the way I use it is that I'm looking for additional information that fits with the overall context of the patient that I'm examining. If I have a, already a fairly strong sense that the patient is um, edematous or has um a dysfunctional right ventricle, for example, then this can add to that if the ultrasound fits with it. Am I going to change course completely if it doesn't fit? No, I think it just, it gives me pause when the IVC findings don't match with a clinical picture. Now let's talk specifically about what are the IVC findings. Now there are different size cutoffs that are listed in um, different specialty literature. most recently, the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine used a two and a half centimeter um, cutoff size as being um, plethoric, and then I have seen other values as well. There's also different uh, variable variability indexes with the respiratory cycle that are proposed, and in general, if you see little or no variation with the respiratory cycle in a non-ventilated patient, that's more concerning as well, uh, that there is significant elevated pressure within the IVC, whether that's related to obstructive shock or volume overload is something you'll have to decide from clinical exam. Now, adding in the nuance that I haven't seen this study necessarily in pregnant patients, uh, but I would imagine because the intra-abdominal pressure is higher in late pregnancy, there would be more of a tendency to have a smaller IVC. So in that case, somebody whose IVC is larger, two and a half centimeters or more, I'm going to feel even more confident that that represents an abnormally large IVC related to edema or obstructive shock, etc. I hope that helps, but it is something unclear. Um, We're going to jump back to the interview and Dr. Young is going to explain her thoughts on the IVC and whether it fits in line with what I just proposed. Mm-hmm. Do you, would you use it differently? Dr. No, I think that's very reasonable to do. There are, you know, a few with heart ultrasound, there are a few expected changes in late pregnancy. Mm. So, but changes in kind of IVC and your assessment of that is not one that I'm aware of. You know, we can see some very mild chamber enlargement. So that atrial and ventricular chamber enlargement shouldn't be 
very large, but you can just see because this is a kind of a physiologic volume loaded state. So you can see some mild chamber enlargement and you might know a little bit more uh, like mitral regurgitation, tricuspid valve regurgitation, again, just because of this more kind of volume expanded state. Pericardial effusions can be present in up to 40% of women that are pregnant. Um, but otherwise, those other, you know, IVC assessment, uh, looking for uh, B lines, uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, so I think your usual practices to do that should be also useful in this patient population, as far as I know. And when we say pericardial effusion, we're saying a small or a trace would be. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It, yes. So, but it can be. Uh, normal and seen, uh, but yeah, usually it's not more than, you know, kind of small-ish okay. uh, effusion, um, certainly wouldn't have any hemodynamic effect. Um, and then those typically resolve kind of six weeks or so after pregnancy, but not uncommon. So if you're doing point of care ultrasound and you notice that, certainly I think make note of it. And obviously if it's large, that's still not normal. But um, if you see a trivial to small effusion, we can see that normally in pregnancy. Okay. Yep. So I've got my my probe and I'm concerned for some beelines. There might be a pleural effusion. I believe that the IVC doesn't look doesn't look right to me. And then I flip up and I'm looking at my uh, ventricular chambers. What is going to lead me towards this diagnosis versus an al- alternate diagnosis? I think it's really going to be your assessment of the chamber size. So again, not it may be a little enlarged just based on normal pregnancy, but it's really going to be your assessment of size. Um, so some of some women with periparam cardiomyopathy can present with quite dilated ventricles, um, and then your your EF assessment, your assessment of their function. If their systolic function is normal and their EF is, um, sorry, if their systolic function is normal and their size looks pretty good, again, um, it may be something that needs more evaluation. But if you're seeing or you're concerned on your POCUS for LV systolic dysfunction, chamber enlargement, that is, um, would say, starting to get towards more concern. Correct, correct. And how's the RV going to play into this? So if I see the RV and it's markedly abnormal versus completely normal and an abnormal left ventricle, which which one of those situations am I going to expect more in this case? With peripartum cardiomyopathy, it should be LV systolic dysfunction, but there can be RV involvement with that, certainly. And those with RV involvement at presentation do have kind of worse outcomes, um, as well as a more dilated ventricle or a more severely reduced ejection fraction at presentation. Those are all markers of kind of a worse uh, prognosis or worse kind of outcomes for recovery. So it is important to note RV involvement, yes or no. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I want to add here is that when you're comparing the RV to the LV outside of pregnancy, in general, the LV should be about 1 to 0.7, the size ratio compared to the RV, where the LV is bigger than the RV. But if you want to be very safe in your ultrasound evaluations, you could just say it's abnormal if the RV is bigger than the LV. The right heart really shouldn't be bigger than the left heart in most patients. Um, One other thing you might see is McConnell sign, which can tip you off about um, an acute elevation in the pulmonary pressures, such as would be seen with pulmonary embolism, for example. And what that is, is when you're looking at the apical four chamber view of the heart. So you see the left ventricle and right ventricle towards the top of your screen and the atria at the bottom of the screen, you see the apex of the RV contracts normally in systole. So it bends forward, or I'm sorry, bends towards the center of the heart. But the right ventricular free wall, so the side of the right ventricle that is um, near the um, 
near the valve, it's not contracting. And so if anything, it bows laterally or outward away from the heart. So the apex contracts down and the lateral wall bows outward. It creates kind of a divot or a notch appearance in the distal RV or like the RV near the apex. If you want to see some videos, there's plenty of great videos on YouTube. And um, I was fortunate enough to work with a very motivated medical student years ago who um, pushed me to publish on this uh, along with some others so I'll include that paper we have a nice diagram that articulates what a McConnell sign looks like and how to use it clinically all right so uh, the other test that most of my patients with dyspnea are going to get is uh, an electrocardiogram and are there signs of uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy on ECG. Does a, a normal ECG mean I can I can just discharge this uh, nice lady home? Uh, or are there signs of prognosis on there that I'm going to look for? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I So there's not per se anything in particular that I look for on the ECG. Um, I think it's it's always interesting if you're noting kind of new, do they have some conduction disease? Do they have a left bundle? Some other clues that may signify, gosh, maybe there was something going on here before um, this presentation. Um, but there's not per se um, a thing that one marker or thing that I look at. Uh, and just to note, though, uh, well, at least here at Mayo, we're, you know, we're fortunate now we have all this work into AI and yeah. ECG. Um, and this is a patient population where that has been validated. So, you know, I would, that's probably one of the first things I would do is go look at the, you know, look at the tracing, but then I would look at the AI algorithms as well. If it's predicting low uh, EF, that has been uh, validated in uh, patients with this condition. Interesting. Um, so, and, and I think more work to come on that uh, through uh, um, uh, here, but I, I would look at that for sure. I'm hoping I pronounce her, her name correctly. Uh, uh, Dr. Aden Dasawe in Mayo Clinic, Florida, has led these studies um, and uh, has done uh, kind of some retrospective work and then a small prospective study, which, um, you know, hopefully some results soon. But yes, I would I would use that as additive information to my uh, evaluation of that patient for sure. So now I'm worried about a patient with peripartum cardiomyopathy. What am I really worried about. So they have heart failure, but what's their chance? What, am I worried that they're going to die, get an arrhythmia? Kind of what happens from here? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, it, I think it depends. So you kind of can have a varied patient population, right? So you can have a mom that's still pregnant, or you could have a mom that's recently delivered. And you both can have more fulminant severe courses, but you do your treatment and kind of what you're worried about does change just a little bit because if mom is still pregnant, we need to be worried about safely delivering baby as well. So let's say in, like in our case, mom is pregnant. So yes, you are worried about um, safety of delivery. Um, so certainly, yes, arrhythmias can happen. Um, thankfully, very severe presentations aren't very common, but they can occur. So women can deteriorate. And um, there are some that need to be assessed for higher level of uh, circulatory support and, and inotropes. Not commonly, but that's when you're assessing them. Um, and it's kind of into that gauge, right? Is this someone that can go to the floor? Is this, is this mm -hmm. someone that's an extremis? cardiogenic shock needs to go to the cardiac intensive care unit. So you're going to be already kind of determining that based on how she's uh, looking and, and what you have in front of you. But if, um, if it's someone that, and I would say that if it's someone that is a more severe presentation, depending on where she's presenting, they sh that's someone that if you're thinking this is cardiogenic shock, uh, she's pregnant, or even if she recently was pregnant, if you're not at a higher level care center, that, that mom should really be probably transferred to a higher level care center where they can uh, assess and evaluate for more advanced heart failure therapies. And I want to dig into that for a minute. Yeah. So at, a, at a lot of emergency departments, I'm going to have the option of where this patient goes. And yeah. when we're saying higher level of care, there are a lot of ICUs, but do I want to go just to an ICU or do I want to go to 
uh, a, a, a center that can op- offer mechanical circulatory support. The latter. Okay. Yep. So you would if if the if you're very concerned about this patient, uh, meaning for you know they they really don't look well, and you're thinking, gosh, this is almost more looking like cardiogenic shock. They should be going to a you know cardiac dedicated intensive care unit or you know one that offers mechanical circulatory support or at least assessment for those services why is that because there are the rate of requiring you know uh advanced therapies is lower but again it comes down to making sure that they're getting the best treatment possible Mm -hmm. and they should absolutely be offered that and Again, taking into consideration um, if mom is pregnant or not, it, it's going to require multidisciplinary team. Mm-hmm. So you need kind of all the help in that situation. So what I'm hearing, just to be explicit about it, we should be thinking in the sickest of sick patients that they should go to a center that can handle ECMO, yep. LVAD, yep. high-risk deliveries. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And if it's more... I mean, all of these presentations are obviously significant, but if it's a more mild presentation, they may do well staying where they are. Um, if they can have telemetry monitoring, see a cardiologist, you get started on the initial medications, and then kind of follow up after, get plugged in at a center after that. But if it's a very sick patient, yes, they should be going where we can do all of those things. Speaking a little bit about some of those medications. Yeah. Let's continue with that very sick patient. Yep. Do you have an inotrope of preference that we should be le- leaning to? Not not per se. Um, I think it's going to be, this, when they're that ill, you're going to be using your kind of standard heart failure therapies. And if they're that ill, there's going to be a concomitant plan of how do we deliver baby? Because in that situation, likely baby's going to need to be delivered early or at, you know, expeditiously. Um, and so you're going to need anesthesia colleagues, OB anesthesia. I mean, it'll, it'll be multi multidisciplinary um, for that. Following further, you talked about standard treatments for heart failure. Yep. So I'm thinking diuretics. Yep. Do you have a diuretic preference? In these no, patients? no, no. I mean, I generally use Lasix. You know, that would be, these are likely going to be diuretic naive patients, you know, most, this is, uh, um, so I generally use Lasix and that is okay to use in pregnancy and postpartum. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I commonly hear about is torsamide. Do you see any concerns with that? I don't see concerns, but I don't usually use that in the acute setting. Tors, that, that, um, is, more of an to me kind of an outpatient it's a, um, I, I I would stick to kind of furosemide and Lasix in that acute setting just because I think we know more about how it acts and um, it's just more commonly what we use in the kind of acute heart failure presentation. The other thing that I have always thought when I take care of other heart failure patients is nitrates. Yep. What are your thoughts on nitrates in this population? Yes. So for, <clears throat> especially if mom is still pregnant, you're, so afterload reduction, right? So in heart failure, we're looking for afterload reduction and hydralazine and nitrates are going to be what you can utilize if mom is pregnant. Yep. So it sounds like a lot of the steps are going to be the same no matter what. If this patient comes in severely dyspneic, I'll probably start some BiPAP, mm-hmm. give a little nitro, consider some Lasix. And if I start to lose my pressure, start some norepi, um, and then consider uh, consider further cardiac support from there. Is that what you would do, Fang? I think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I, my understanding with nitrates, just to be more specific, is that we're talking about IV nitroglycerin, and then the the infusion rates. I have to look up, but they're not small. They're they're big. They're bigger. Yeah, and it's usually could be limited by blood pressure or mm-hmm. hemodynamics. Um, but yes, it would be kind of more you're looking at kind of an, uh, an IV probably in this uh, very acute type presentation. Yep. Exactly. I, um, I think that's interesting. I'd love to talk about that uh, more with you, Venk, because so the way I actually bolus uh, my nitro rather than bolusing off the pump at something like 400 micrograms is I just give a sublingual dose because... Uh, Generally, I think the the plasma, uh, the amount that I get from that is very high. And so that's uh, one or two sublingual nitros. I get a pretty good bolus from that. Um, I definitely agree with, because if you're looking for arterial or dilation, 
your your IV rates are really high. Um, but I often start still at chest pain levels and I double up. Uh, I find that that works better with team dynamics. And, uh, and so um, I start and I double every five minutes until I see a desired effect. Um, that's kind of how I approach it. How do you approach that? I would hesitate to put anything in their mouth if I'm putting them on BiPAP. Mm. Um, so if I can't do IV because of limited IV access or I have other priorities for my IVs, then I'd probably use paste. But I'm going to generally prefer to use the IV mm. fusion in that population, yeah. but only because repeatedly taking the mask on and off, not only is it limiting their BiPAP consistency, but then are they going to aspirate their little nitro tab or something, you know, mm. making it already complicated situation a little yeah. bit worse. But, but you didn't I, know that was where this case was going. No, now we're bronking for no. a nitro tab. I yes, love it. exactly. <laughs> um, um, I don't typically in the emergency department use ACEs and ARBs in heart failure, mm-hmm. but I know they have protective benefits. Yep. Am I doing the right thing here or should I I think be? that's the right thing. And remember ACEs and ARBs, so your so Arnie's the newest class, right? That's in Tresto, your ACEs, ARBs, all of those are contraindicated in pregnancy. Even so better. if patient is pregnant, we cannot and do not want to use any of those because of the teratogenic effects. So so no ACEs, no ARBs, um, uh, Arnie's, uh, all of those are kind of out if mom is, is pregnant. So if mom is pregnant and does have heart failure, and most commonly, so we use diuretics. We can use beta blockers. Again, if they're acutely decompensated from heart failure, you will not be beta blocking them. But that can be used if it's, again, something that we're instituting for cardiomyopathy or, or heart protection. Uh, we do use beta blockers, most commonly metoprolol succinate or metoprolol tartrate. Um, and then um, hydralazine and nitrates are what we have to use for afterload reduction uh, would be kind of your go-to when mom is pregnant. So if mom is not breastfeeding and she's postpartum, it's you could really use any therapies. If mom is breastfeeding, then ACEs and ARBs, uh, so the only one that I use would be enalapril, is safe for use in breastfeeding. Um, so that's my go-to ACE inhibitor. Still can use diuretics, still can use beta blockers if mom is breastfeeding. Um, and then some of our newer therapies, again, in Tresto or Arnie's or SGLT2 inhibitors, those, again, not studied a lot in mom in, in breastfeeding or lactation. So I would not use those if mom is breastfeeding. This is an incredibly helpful. I'd also ask for your recommendation for our listeners when they're in the moment and they have to pick some of these meds. This podcast may be far off. One Um, As I was preparing, uh, there was this uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology review by um, Halpern and colleagues, and they they just looked at cardiac meds uh, that were safe to use in pregnancy. And uh, we'll include the link in our show notes, but it had this this really nice diagram that was like green, can't give. And I was like, "This this is a good resuscitation bay diagram. But is there anything you use for when you're uh, uh, trying to guide a colleague over the phone on what meds they can and can't give any common things. That's the main thing. I think, I think the takeaway would be remember ACEs, ARBs, and then I always always include the Arnie's now because those are so common. We, we use them a lot now, um, upfront if we can, um, in heart failure, but none of those can be used if mom is pregnant. If mom is breastfeeding, enalapril is the ACE inhibitor that has been studied and I consider okay to use. Um, Otherwise, even the ARBs and ARNIs still are no. Beta blockers, I consider safe through pregnancy and and lactation. Um, Just to a caveat on that, atenolol should never be used. It's the one beta blocker that definitely has been studied and shown some intrauterine growth restriction. That's the concern with beta blockers. Okay. So um, the concern is that risk of intrauterine growth restriction for baby. But um, many have been used, and if mom has a strong indication for it, we consider it okay. If uh, So for instance, let's say, kind of away from this case, but it's a mom with an, a different kind of cardiomyopathy, but I want to keep her on a beta blocker through pregnancy. I We do that. Um, and 
Uh, we have lots of moms that have other cardiac conditions or arrhythmias, and they're on beta blockers through pregnancy. And that is okay. But again, working with our MFM colleagues or our obstetric colleagues, they will typically then, depending on kind of the dose of the beta blocker, monitor baby's growth more closely um, just to make sure uh, there is or isn't uh, effect or you know make sure that baby is growing okay. Clinically speaking, I have never have yet to stop a beta blocker because of a concern of, of, of that. But I would say definitely not a tenolol in pregnancy or lactation in this patient population. No, uh, most commonly um, and most studied is probably metoprolol for beta blockers. I'm going to just take the moment to remind our listeners that if you haven't listened to chapter 17 on lactation optimization in the emergency department with Dr. Sarah Dodd, um, one of our anesthesiologists, Highly, highly recommended. Perfect. She gives a framework to have those conversations about medication safety and then also a way to manage the resources uh, when they give you different grades and how to apply that to your practice. So, Great. Chapter 17, April 1st of this year. So um, I'm assessing a patient who presents with an arrhythmia, mm-hmm. such as AFib or mm-hmm. VTAC. How might my approach be similar or different to a heart failure patient that is not pregnant or doesn't have peripartum cardiomyopathy. Yeah, <clears throat> so you're right. So yes, women with peripartum, cardio- card- peripartum cardiomyopathy can certainly have arrhythmias. I think most likely, uh, I mean, you would be concerned about ventricular arrhythmias in particular. So it's going to depend on, it's it's hard to say exa- exactly a blanket approach because mm-hmm. it's going to depend on their presentation, yeah. how severe, what I will say, though, is that if mom is unstable and she's in a ventricular arrhythmia, you are going to treat that like you would, you know, you know we would do our uh, um, cardioversion, you know, we would, we would defibrillate, we would do what we needed to do in that setting. Um, now, there are certain antiarrhythmics that may be preferred if mom is still pregnant, mm-hmm. um, for instance, um, uh, lidocaine. Uh, amiodarone in general is, is we don't, that is a last, last resort in pregnancy. Okay. Um, but again, if mom is very unstable, I, I, so it really depends on the clinical situation when we're talking about those type of arrhythmias. Absolutely. But you will, if that's the situation, I think if the if she's presenting acutely to you, decompensated, unstable, you would go through your ACLS. Yeah very similar. Um, but if you have time or it's less severe, you may pick and choose various therapies that are safer to use during pregnancy if, if mom is still pregnant um, or breastfeeding. But again, it, it will depend on how they're presenting. Similarly for AFib, um, you know, we, we do, even in pregnancies, you can cardiovert moms. Um, they're, you know, they may do fetal monitoring. There's mm. a small risk of fetal arrhythmias or bradycardia, but again, we would be able to monitor baby. But again, it would depend on the situation. If that's the best treatment and necessary, these things can be done. That's incredibly, and part of it is I've asked a, a very broad question, which is, uh, and sometimes in the middle of the night, these things are really hard to work through. Yeah. And so I think about a patient with atrial fibrillation. And by definition, if I'm saying their EF is, you know, less than 45 or less than 40, they're, they're kind of a high risk group. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things I would normally do, such as start with something like deltaism, I probably shouldn't do, uh, in a standard patient because, uh, because of their increased risk, risk for mortality. And so in those patients, the European society of cardiology guidelines are, for a, a, a regular patient who has an EF less than 40 would be either uh, uh, the smallest dose of a beta blocker mm-hmm. to achieve rate control. Um, so I'm thinking metoprolol instead of deltaizam yes. or something like uh, digoxin mm-hmm. or something like that. Would those basic principles for a stable AFib patient and peripartum cardiomyopathy hold true also? Because yes. metoprolol was safe. Yep. Um, yep, I would. Yes, I would avoid, especially if you know their EF is reduced. Mm-hmm. 
I would not use calcium channel blockers. Okay. So I would uh, I would agree with using the beta blockers, okay. and I would go for metoprolol. And digoxin is also safe in pregnancy. That's yep. awesome. Yep. So I can apply that those same hallmarks of uh, my resuscitation, and then similarly for my stable ventricular arrhythmia patient, um, the key thing is. Amiodarone causes a lot of bad things in general, and so if I can, do lidocaine. Okay, so I have, at this point, I think we have an approach, Venk, and to summarize back, so for my acutely decompensated heart failure patient, I'm going to do a lot of the same things. I'm going to start with some nitrates, some diuresis, positive pressure support as needed, and inotropic support um, as, as needed. And so I have my really sick patient in kind of one bucket. And then if I'm thinking about transferring that patient, it's going to be to an ICU dedicated to cardiac care. But especially these patients are young, salvageable. Mm-hmm. They, yes. they are patients that we're really thinking about all VADs if necessary and uh, balloon pumps and ECMO uh, if they require that level of support. For the more stable patient, they're probably still going to need more of uh, a thorough evaluation with things like an echo to figure out what's going on. And so we'll probably end up leaning towards admission for these patients. Mm -hmm. If they develop an arrhythmia, I'm actually going to manage it in a fairly similar way. I'm going to consider the medications uh, individually, but in particular favoring beta blockers where possible. But my other antiarrhythmics, I'm favoring lidocaine over amio. Venk is rolling his eyes because I thought I'm, I would likely admit a patient that I'm making a new <laughs> diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy. Are you going to discharge this patient, Venk? I would say my heart wants to keep them. Okay. In the current state where we don't have inpatient beds for patients with moderate to severe illness, we have to re- reconsider new some of EF this. less than 45%. Well, we're not getting a number in the department. Yeah. So what I'm using is a person who is saying they're short of breath but doesn't need advanced oxygen. Okay. Their BNP is 600. They raise my attention for this consideration, but do they absolutely need to be in the hospital and wait in the emergency department 15 to 20 hours for a bed? Probably not. And I can, especially at a center like ours, by that time, they could probably see an outpatient cardiologist <laughs> instead of waiting and watching our terrible TV and eating deli sandwiches in our, you know, so pure salt, right? Pure salt, and so it's not to say I'm going to discharge somebody who's needing advanced oxygen or like new oxygen even, or who can't walk to the bathroom without mm-hmm. stopping, but if they can function reasonably. Maybe they're not going for a jog or going up the stairs at their house, but they can stay in the main floor and they have support. I probably would send them home these days. Am I? Well, um, the only caveat I would say is that if mom is still pregnant, that would be where I might be watching her a little bit closer or really probably talking to obstetrics and probably having her monitored. and, And while we expeditiously make sure we are doing because again we want to assess the need for is this going to affect delivery of baby do we need to be more urgent about things so I would err towards admission um, if they're postpartum and they're doing okay and you can get very very close follow up possibly yes I'm also very conserved so I'd want to keep them all as well I like <laughs> I do too yeah it's just yeah. that we can't ad- admit patients who are on. Yeah. Supplemental oxygen these days. Yeah. Um, so uh, the other question along those lines, do they get admitted to obstetrics or cardiology? Yeah. So I think it's a little, I would say if mom is still pregnant here, they usually get admitted to obstetrics and then cardiology comes on board to follow along and, and uh, uh, consult. Um, if she's very ill, the, the she'd usually go to the cardiac ICU here. If she's uh, postpartum, she may actually end up going to uh, a cardiology service is what I would suspect. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your time with this. Are there any final words you would give to an emergency medicine audience about peripartum cardiomyopathy? 
Um, I would say I think the most important thing would be to consider the diagnosis. So in a patient that was pregnant or recently pregnant, to keep this on your differential, um, using those things we've talked about throughout the episode to help guide you. But remember to think about it. And um, that's one of the uh, I think our ways that we can help reduce maternal mortality and make an impact is, you know, considering these uh, diagnoses, remembering them, and kind of helping guide women to getting the appropriate care when necessary. So that that would be my main plug, and to call your cardiology colleagues when you need. Thank you so much. This yep. is incredible. You've been amazing. Well, there you have it, folks. Another chapter of Always On EM is done. Alex and I are particularly grateful to Dr. Young. We appreciate you so much and grateful to each and every one of you for listening and sharing your time with us and our work. If you can, please be sure to subscribe to our show. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please write a comment. We would be so appreciative. The computer algorithm factors these things into its decision on whether or not to put our show in front of other people. And so it would really help us to reach a broader audience. Don't forget to come back October 14th. We have a Grand Rounds episode that is fantastic. It's on an amazing topic that we don't hear much about, and it causes us a lot of difficulty in the emergency department. And I think our speaker will give you a framework that you can apply that will make some challenging encounters much easier. Definitely don't miss it. Have a safe Halloween. Everyone eat lots of candy. See you next time. The Always On EM Podcast, hosted by Alex Finch and Vank Balamkanda.